uh, Mr. Nadkarni reminded, please keep your microphones muted. And uh, yeah, another point I'd like to, uh, well, we will put together a survey link that will be shared after this, uh, this webinar. So we'd like you to suggest uh, some topics for future webinars. We have a few candidates, uh, TMCP rolling, uh, recrystallization studies on Glebo, uh, Glebo uh, general use, and we have a, well, a few titles, but uh, we want to hear from you what, uh, what, what are the topics that you are interested in. Okay, so I'd like to invite now uh, Mr. Eric Dates uh, to uh, deliver his presentation about how to restart the Glebo after a long shutdown period. Thank you very much. I'll be here. I'll turn my camera uh, and microphone off. Uh, I'll be here all the time. Thanks. Eric, please. Thank you, Fulvio. Uh, before you head off, can you confirm you can hear me? Okay. Yes, we, yes, can, we, we, can, uh, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, so as Fulvio said, I'm Eric Diz, I'm a service engineer at DSI. Uh, I'll be giving this little presentation we have right here. Uh, the global restart procedure after an extended shutdown, uh, as we're all experiencing right now, essentially. Uh, so Gleeble is a, a fairly complex system. There's a lot of components that if they have been shut down, need to turn back on um, and make sure they, they function as they did before, essentially. Uh, so right here is a list, the agenda that extends to another slide, but uh, this is the first slide of the agenda. Um, the first thing will be just a, a quick visual inspection, um, most just looking for, for leaks or other things of that kind that have been going on for some time, perhaps, that'll perhaps indicate where that we will start leaking from if it does um, once we turn it back on. Uh, we'll want to check the compressor, uh, power that back on, check for leaks for that. Uh, the chiller as well, um, power the Gleeble unit itself back up, as well as once it is up, we want to make sure that the hydraulic system works, the heating system works, um, the vacuum if so equipped, which I expect most of your systems have vacuums. It's pretty rare we have a system without a vacuum. Um, Air is an additional check that's worthwhile since it's it's perhaps the best way to confirm that the um, pneumatic system is working or one of the easier ways to check that the pneumatic system is working, which is important. Um, and then additional maintenance items that would be prudent to cover at this time. So let's get into the first section, the visual inspection. Um, so the first thing that I thought to, or that we figured to cover in here was, um, a quick inspection of the hydraulic pump. So there's a picture in the bottom of, is it visible to everyone? Yes, it all looks good. You could, okay, here we go. All right, I want to make sure it's on the right slide. Um, so there's a picture of the hydraulic pump down there. Um, the few things I think would be worth looking at would be just to uh, check at first that it's still connected to um, the electrical power and the cooling circuit. Um, so you can see there in the picture on the bottom right, there should be a few hoses connected to that loop right there. Um, that'll be your cooling and the uh, power should be coming in from the top of the NEMA box, presumably. Um, it's best to certainly have an electrician if you're going to be doing any kind of electrical checks going inside the NEMA box, the electrical box, anything like that. Um, it'll definitely, you'll want to have an electrician there for that. Um, just to make sure everything is still in the condition that you've left it. Uh, then after that, uh, I think it'd just be pragmatic to check for oil leaks. Uh, check for glycol leaks. Uh, again, the glycol leaks should be just around that little cooling loop right there and really probably only there. there. Really 
Sorry, what was that? Um, the oil leaks in her hand could be in a few more places. So you can continue. Right. Um, the oil leaks, the most probable place for an oil leak most of the time is around the filter canister. That's, I know there's an arrow to that in the back. It's a little bit hard to see. Um, but that's the only place where things are really being changed on a remotely regular basis. So that would be the most likely place you're going to have a leak. Um, it, it'll pull up underneath it if it does. Um, but it's possible that if maybe one of the input the return or supply hoses are, are leaking or getting a little bit loose, it might leak from there too. So I have a couple of arrows down there pointing to them as well. Less likely, but a possibility. So checking for things like that before we power everything back on. Another quick check is to be to uh, look at the side of the pump um, on the side of the reservoir near the hoses connections themselves. Um, at this little sight gauge right here that indicates how much oil is in the system. Now, if it's still connected to your Gleeble, um, obviously, if oil's gone to the hose and out to Gleeble, it will, it will be less than indicated, less than it was originally indicated here. Um, but somewhere around the amount shown in this picture would be should be just fine. Uh, if the oil level is significantly below that middle black line, you may want to add more. Um, but it is a simple estimation, something similar to what's shown in this picture here is appropriate. That should be good enough. Uh, at this point, we can move on to the main Gleeble system. Uh, again, we want to just confirm that it's connected to the electrical source, the, uh, the coolant source, the or the hydraulic and pneumatic sources. Um, so those will all, mostly all go in underneath the uh, load unit electrical box. There'll be a number of connections that all go in there for your air and your cooling and power and hydraulics all go in through there. Um, for the functionality of the Auxiliary systems, the will need canvas communication throughout the system. So um, the hydraulic pump, the vacuum, if so equipped, any other additional items that use the canvas connections shown in the picture in the bottom left, those will need to be attached. So it's good to make sure they're not hanging down on the floor nearby. That's you know, they fall down every now and then, so it's good to check. Um, picture on the right shows just a, a picture of the vacuum tank, hopefully it's easy enough to see that. Uh, you can make out the outline of the vacuum tank main O-ring seal. Uh, that one, as well as the one in the back, it'd be good to check those, make sure that uh, they're lubricated. If, if they're not, sort of make sure they're not cracked or anything like that. Um, we ship a replacement or two uh, at the time of installation with the unit. So you may have the replacement of that if it is cracked. If it's cracked, you may not have a good vacuum. So um, it's be worthwhile to replace it and re-grease that with a light coating of grease, just enough to lubricate the ring. Uh, let's see. Same as the hydraulic pump, it'd be good to check for oil leaks. This would mean going inside um, taking one of the covers off with the power off, that's, as long as the power's off, that's okay. Um, but if you if you see oil pooling underneath the unit that, or a glycol, that would probably be good enough to get a sense that perhaps something's dripping inside the unit and take a look from there. Again, any electrical checks, you should certainly have an electrician with you for that. The uh, first item we'll actually power on in this discussion is the compressor. So this is just a few pictures I took from the uh, our parts catalog. Yours may not look like this at all. I've, I, the ones I remember in India didn't look like either of these, but hopefully I'll give you some idea. Um, 
I figured some users may not be all that appropriate or all that uh, familiar with their their compressor with their chiller since usually they aren't even in the Gleevel, the main Gleevel lab room. Um, so I uh, might help with a few pictures in there and just to get a quick visual of what they look like. Uh, so the compressor may or may not be pressurized still given the time frame what was being done when it was last used. Uh, so it may be worthwhile just to start deep with depressurizing the compressor itself. Uh, when that's done, you can uh, there will be a drain valve on it located somewhere on, on the frame. Um, it'd be certainly worthwhile to open the drain valve uh, and let any water that's been stored in there, which hopefully won't be much of anything, um, get that out of there before you start running the compressor. You never want to have oil or uh, you never want water in your compressor to build up. When that's done, you can close the drain valve again. Um, similar to the other components, check to make sure that it's connected to the electrical source um, with an electrician present. I, I doing the checks ideally. Um, and then power back on to your power on the wall breaker, providing power to it and everything else. And then you want to actually turn on and make sure that it, it builds pressure as it should. So um, it's important that it functions. And um, at that point, you could check for leaks uh, throughout your air circuit. Essentially, we'll focus just on the compressor for now. Um, there will be an outlet going to your glee where you can check there for air hissing out or um, follow the air hose to the glee. Well, that may be difficult if it's under the floor or something, um, but if possible, uh, better to check for the air than just ignore it. Um, then you certainly check at the inlet to the Gleeble system, which is shown in the picture in the bottom. Um, with the filter canister, there's, as you can see, quite a few connections, uh, junctions there. So that's a potential location for a leak, certainly. Um, if any of the fittings are leaking, you could try putting a little bit of super lube at the mating surfaces and see if that resolves your issue. The next item we'll look at is the chiller which again may be something that people may not be overly familiar with. So um, just in case there's a few pictures again from our parts catalog of what some of the ones that, that we sell look like, yours may or may not look like that. I know, I know some of them out in India do not look like these. They're not Bannenbergs or Dimplex, which are primarily what we uh, sell, but not necessarily all the time, all the cases. Um, one of the first checks here, similar to the hydraulic pump, would be to make sure that you uh, have sufficient fluid in your in your chiller. Um, so there will be a sight glass somewhere on it. Uh, I tried to capture the two more common scenarios that there may be just a small opening on the frame with a, a tube behind it that uh, indicates your oil or your your coolant level. It may be as obvious as an outside tube like is what's shown in the picture on the right. Um, there should be one of those two things, most likely, um, with indications of low level, high level, somewhere in between will be appropriate for your, your Gleevel system, near, near the fill level, ideally. And there should also, there will, should be a, an opening should be reasonably clear where to where to fill from. It's usually either straight from the little tube itself on the right, or there will be a, a port somewhere on the perhaps the top of the chiller on systems um, like the one on the left, typically to refill it from. Uh, once you know it's refilled, you can start powering it up again. Um, again, uh, have an electrician confirm that it's still connected electrically. Uh, 
turn all the breakers to it, everything like that, power it back on. Um, but typically it's important to not return to operation immediately. Um, many of the chillers, you know, they, they'll have compressors in them, um, which the crankcase heater for the compressor will need some time to warm up properly so as to not wear out prematurely. Um, the amount of time will vary based on the design of the chiller. So, um, so it's not to go into too much detail. I just feel it's better to say that you should check your chiller manual, which will be provided um, along with the binders, your Glebe operations manual, your Glebe options manual is where the chiller guide to the chiller manual is typically included. Um, so check your check your the binders you provided with your system and installation. Um, find your chiller manual in there and look for. Uh, it should say how long to run it, um, how long to let it warm up before running your chiller. Uh, it varies depending on the system again. So we sell Dimplex. We use Dimplex chillers a lot. Uh, those ones require eight hours time. Eight hours time powered on but not operating to ensure it's warmed up adequately. Uh, we use Fanbergs a fair bit. Those it's only about two hours. Um, so it varies depending on the model you have, the, the designer of the chiller. Um, so be sure to look in your manual for that. Once that time has passed, you can at that point turn your chiller on. Um, it's a good check at that point is to confirm that the uh, chiller responds to temperature input properly. So on the bottom, there's a little picture of one of the displays for a Dimplex chiller. Um, it's important to monitor that for a while and confirm once the set point succeeded by the given amount, maybe one degree Celsius, something like that, that it will start cooling again. Just to make sure it's working properly. That's, you know, the that is essentially the check for the chiller. Um, so on this next slide, here's an example. I pulled this from uh, a Dimplex manual that I had access to. So you can see in the middle here, it says these units have power supply to the unit with this, the power, it should be powered um, at the switch for eight hours prior to starting the chiller. So that's, that's the Dimplex example from the manual that I had access to. Um, so you should have something similar in uh, the manual provided for your systems. Just take a look for that to know how long to warm each other up for first. And then like the other units, again, we'll want to check for leaks. Um, externally, you, you may see leaks at the inputs or outputs as shown in this photo here, all the hoses. Um, you may see a leak there. That be, should be pretty, pretty quick, easy to resolve if that's the case. Um, it's possible it could be an internal leak though. So um, those are usually only evident if you uh, just check underneath the chiller after a certain amount of time. And if there's glycol pulling up there, then you may have to power down, take some of the covers off and try to locate where that's coming from. Maybe it was overfilled or um, the coolant coming back was too much at one time. Um, so we want to check those few things. So next, we'll move to actually powering the Glebe on, checking that the boot up sequence goes properly. Uh, so to power on the Glebe system, uh, many of you are, I would expect, familiar with this portion of it. Um, so you would want to just make sure you're whatever circuit breaker on the mount on the, on the wall you have that goes to your Glebe that you want to switch on. You want to try and power at the load unit handle right there in the middle. And at that point, the power button should dimly illuminate. Um, assuming it does, then you can press the power button power on your Glebe. Um, so that will lead to the boot up sequence. Uh, you want to watch that. Um, once it's booted, uh, the first time as you 
all the operators will know it'll be in a reset or a panic safety state. So you have to reset that with the reset button on the, on the front of the console. Um, I say in here, um, once that's done to reboot the console again, uh, using either the reset button on the embedded PC um, for the series three consoles or just going back to fig mode and then accept configuration to go back to run mode again for GTC consoles. I say that because um, when you first power on the Gleeble and it's in a reset safety, reset state, panic safety state, it can just be a little more confusing um, to try to determine which messages are legitimate and which ones are being caused simply are simply present because of the um, emergency stop state. Uh, so I figured easier, especially if someone isn't particularly familiar with all the trouble messages or the functionality of the panic safety system, just to boot it up and get it through that panic safety system, that panic safety state first, and then reboot it again. That, at that point, the, any error messages you see will be legitimate, presumably. Um, so as it's booting, you can watch the console screen, look for errors on there. Maybe it'll say module 12 error. Um, once it's booting, we'll say oil level high, something like that. Um, watch for things like that. Uh, you'll also want to look at the self-test, see that pat, see that passes or fails. Uh, it, it may move a little too quickly to really monitor all of that. Um, but if you weren't able to catch it, then you can certainly just look at the LEDs in the front of the, the modules in that slot on the, on the front of the console and look for them to be green or red. If they're green, that means the self-test passed for that module. If they're red, that failed the, some component. The zero test didn't pass. The upscale test didn't pass. Um, in the case where there were errors um, or the self-test failed, any of those, any of the modules self-test failed, um, do your best to diagnose the, diagnose the issue. Um, obviously, you can contact DSI, DTS if that's necessary, and we can help you out with that um, if there seem to be any lingering issues in that regard. So next, we'll talk about the hydraulic control, making sure that that is still functional. Um, once the Gleeble's up and running, and um, has power and everything else, we can test the hydraulic system, make sure that we can still move the stroke back and forth, that the, the servo is still working, essentially. Um, the first prudent check, I think, would be to check the pressure buildup. So your system in low pressure should be roughly 1,000 PSI. In high pressure should be roughly 3,000 psi. Um, so just we we'll want to confirm that we still get to those pressure levels. Um, so to do that, we can close the vacuum tank door um, and make sure that it's it reads that it's closed. So the, the console the little door safety icon, um, either just a little circle in the bottom center for Series Three consoles or the little. Um, padlock icon in the uh, top right for GTC consoles should should change when you close the door. Um, as long as it does, you can try turning on the mechanical system. The low pressure, so you, so you get your 1,000 PSI on these gauges right here. These are um, on the front load unit right there, present to the, to the operator. And as long as you can get your 1,000 PSI, you can turn on high pressure as well, make sure you get 3,000 PSI for that. Um, that's what we're looking for here. And so once we have that, we should test for actual mechanical control and not just the pressure. Um, so uh, for this, there's the difference between the door open state and the door being closed. Uh, so it's it only takes a moment, so it's worth checking both, essentially, I, I feel. Um, so the first thing we can do in that case is uh, I guess press the stop button to get it back to mechanical system being off and then uh, open the vacuum tank door and turn mechanical back on low pressure and try moving the stroke back and forth with the door open. It, it should be slow as most of you know, but it, it should move back and forth under control if it's working properly. Um, then try closing the door 
And again, moving it, it should be quite a bit faster at that point. Um, you should still have your control just as normal. And then try going back to high pressure again and moving the stroke in tension, moving the stroke in compression. Um, you're using your knob on your on your console and make sure you have control there. If, if you don't, then there's definitely something going going on. Um, if it's not particularly smooth, maybe a little bit a little bit jumpy or something, um, particularly if maybe you did have to reconnect a hose um, or maybe a filter was changed somewhat just before now. Um, it, it may be a little bit jumpier, um, in which case it'd be worthwhile to break in the stroke some run a program that will just move it back and forth a bunch to try and if there is something in there um, that's running through the servo and making it inconsistent to try and get to work that out of the servo before continuing. Um, so we typically call that a break-in program. Uh, I included a little little snippet of that underneath this. Uh, so the program right there that uh, is illustrated in the bottom is what we'll typically use to try to to get any any air air bubbles anything like that introduced by a changing of a hose or uh, a change of oil filter to get that worked out of the system. So what a program I guess will do is simply move the stroke a large amount in one direction and move it back and repeat that as many times as necessary. So in this case, we're moving the stroke 50 millimeters in tension, holding it there for one second, then moving it 50 millimeters back uh, and repeating that 200 times. Uh, it doesn't need to be that speed. It doesn't need to be, that's 100 millimeters per second. It doesn't need to be that speed. It doesn't need to be that distance necessarily. It doesn't need to be 200 times. Um, it's just, this is just an example of what to, what we'll, something like this is what we'll use. Um, finally, if you are using a uh, hydro wedge or a torsion or a max strain, you want to do something similar to make sure you have the control. Uh, the torsion specifically, especially, does operates quite a bit differently um, than the wedge or the max strain or the stroke. Really, You'll, you're just spinning your encoder at that point. Um, but they all function the same. You want to move whatever appropriate knob you have on your console and make sure that they respond appropriately to that. Uh, next, we want to check heating functionality. So for this, we'll need to put a sample in there and actually try heating it. Um, but first, it's good just to check that it's responding to the heating input, essentially. Um, so again, you want to first confirm your, your vacuum tank door is closed. It should have been closed from the last step. Um, and confirm that the door safety icon is green to con confirm that the system knows that you're in a, in a uh, safe state to heat. The system will not heat if you have the door open. Um, at that point, turn on, press the heating button or, you know, run, run thermal on the, uh, on the, in the series three systems. And you should hear the heating contactor close in the load unit NEMA box. It's kind of a, a bang you might hear back there. Um, that's indicating your heating contactor is closing. If that doesn't close, you're again, not gonna be able to heat. So that's important to know that that is still working properly. This hasn't gotten stuck in some, in either a closed or open state. Um, once you know that's going on, uh, you hit the stop button, shut that back down. And then weld a sample like you normally would, um, just something something simple. Uh, we ship a number of samples with the machine at installation time for acceptance tests. If you have any of those remaining, that'd be a perfect choice for this. Um, just weld a sample, load it into the Gleevel, um, and then try, try to heat that manually. Many of you may not be familiar with manual heating, so we'll explain it right here briefly. Um, to do that, you'll want to just once it's loaded and you have the door closed and everything's safe and you're, you, you can do so um, without potentially injuring yourself, uh, you can just hit the heating button or run thermal in the case of the Series 3 console. And then um, you want to make sure whatever TC pair you connect your thermocouples to 
is the one that's the control, the, the temperature control. Um, and once you, that's set correctly, uh, I don't have pictures, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. Uh, once that's set correctly, you'll you can just uh, adjust your your temp trim knob, either the left side knob on the lower control assembly for GTC, or just one of the knobs on the right side on the Series Three console. Uh, you want to just adjust that knob until the uh, temp trim value exceeds your TC reading. Uh, once that happens, you should see your power angle or your heat power, depending on the age of your system. You should see that start to increase a little bit, and the temperature should sh should follow suit shortly afterwards. Um, once you start seeing your heating, you can turn the knob a little bit faster so that it heats at a reasonable rate. Um, the point of that is more so just to con confirm that it is heating smoothly. Um, it shouldn't be jagged or it shouldn't. You shouldn't have like a, a, a sudden burst of heat followed by, you know, it followed by it overshooting immensely. It shouldn't do that. It should heat like it, like it did before. Essentially, you want to make sure that it's heating properly, heating smoothly. If there are issues with that, um, you can again contact us for assistance. We can talk you through that, try and troubleshoot what's going on. Uh, next item we'll look at is the vacuum system. For those equipped with it, which is against, I think, most of you. Um, probably, yeah, the first reasonable check, I think, would be uh, the oil levels in the vacuum. So depending on, again, which component you have, you, you may have two rough pumps. You may just have one. Uh, you may have a diffusion pump. You may not. Uh, depending on which components you have, you'll want to just take a quick look at your vacuum unit and see where the levels lie on any pumps you have attached to your system. So there's a rough pump on the left and a diffusion pump on the right, uh, both with sight glasses that are reasonably clear what they mean, certainly the diffusion pump one. So when it's cold on the diffusion pump side, it should be at that full cold level right there. Um, when it's hot, it should be somewhere near the full hot level. Um, so you can, since it's not powered up at the moment, you, if, it, if it's below the full cold level, you could just um, open up the little uh, nut above that and just add some more fluid until it is at the full cold level. Uh, the rough pump is, it might be a little bit hard to see in this picture, but there's there's three lines essentially. Um, the, there's the top two, which is the second from the top is roughly where the oil level is now in that picture. That's roughly where you want it when it's cold. Um, if it's significantly below that, maybe closer to the bottom line, you'll definitely want to add more before you start running it, or you may, your vacuum may struggle. Um, so check those, refill them as necessary. Uh, that's pretty straightforward oil filling process, something particularly intricate there. Um, one thing to note though is to be sure to use the correct oil for your pump. Your diffusion pump will not, will not appreciate having rough pump oil using it, it will not react well to that at all. Do not do that. Um, likewise, your rough pump is not designed to be used with diffusion pump oil. Um, if you have both, you will have been provided with both um, diffusion pump oil and rough pump oil. Make sure you have the right one for your pump. Don't don't assume that, you know, just any vacuum oil will work in, in them. Make sure you have the right stuff there, the right oil for your pumps. Um, since we're going to be testing the vacuum out, it's functioning on the system. We want to make sure that it is still connected to your Gleevel. So just quickly confirm that your bellows tube is still attached. Um, as shown in the picture on the left, it's still connected to your, uh, your MCU, whatever that is, a pocket jar or hydro wedge. Uh, you want to confirm like the other systems, like the other components, um, that you have your power cable connected, you have your coolant connected, your pneumatic uh, poses, everything is attached to the Gleevel so you have all your energy sources for your vacuum that it can function properly. Um, which are indicated on the picture on the right, you can see there's the two red hoses there for your coolant for your vacuum. The one little black hose underneath it is an air hose for your vacuum. And then the power is in that 
large red plug to the side. That's where all those should go. Um, if the if the power plug is not attached, you should shut your Google down before attaching that, just because that is 400 volts, 480 volts going through that. So just for safety reasons, better to power off your Google first, have your electrician do that. Um, and then when it's fully attached and everything is correct, uh, go ahead and uh, actually test out your vacuum, make sure your performance is roughly where it was before. Um, to do that, you can turn your vacuum, your rough vacuum on first. Uh, that should get to somewhere below, at least at least a little bit below uh, seven times 10 to the negative one tor. If it doesn't reach that, you won't get to rough vacuum. So you should get to mid 10 to the negative one tor range um, with your rough pump. If it's really, really clean, maybe you'll get a little bit better than that. You might see negative two. Uh, assuming that's working, you'll try your high vac. Um, turn that on. Again, that will need to warm up for about maybe 15 minutes. Um, so your oil is hot enough that you actually can get your rough vac levels. Um, once it's warmed up for maybe 15 minutes, about 15 minutes is what we say. Uh, try actually testing that and uh, see what you can get with that. That should get to 10 to the negative five tor within 15 minutes. That's what we specify. Um, if it's not there, you probably have a leak somewhere, uh, but that's our, that's our standard for the vacuum operation essentially. Um, as many of the users here know, there's additional vacuum functions besides just Pulling the vacuum, there's the venting function needs to work certainly, um, and there is any inert gas backfilling works through through the vacuum system. Uh, so I want to test both of those. Um, having just pumped down the system, you can you can go straight to testing the venting function just by pressing the tank vent button. Make sure that it vents all the vacuum back to a normal atmospheric level. Um, and once that's done, you can connect a gas canister, uh, nitrogen or something, uh, to your vacuum with the inert gas hose attached uh, attached to the, the vacuum unit, um, as you normally would, uh, and check that the vacuum tank fill function works. That's also important for many of you, certainly. Um, just in case hey, you are not familiar with that, um, you know, briefly describing how that works. When you press the tank fill button on this on the Google console, that will pull a rough vacuum. Uh, once it hits 2.5 times 10 to the zero tor, um, it will begin back filling with whatever inert gas you have. So you want to make sure that you have your gas canister attached and um, the valve open so you can you can input the gas to the to the vacuum tank. Um, and once it starts back filling, just watch the the gauge shown there in the picture that's located on the top, just above the vacuum tank door, and just monitor that and make sure that you're seeing an, an increasing value um, as it's filling, that the, the reading on there is changing. As long as that is, then it's working fine and your vacuum seems to be operational. Um, the, the last check of this kind uh, that I include in here is a, an air ram operation check. Just a, a quick check to make sure that the uh, pneumatic system is working as expected, essentially. Uh, so the first thing to do for this would be to remove your coupler. It, it's, it might be hard to, to really witness the, the air ram moving properly um, if it's not decoupled. Uh, the coupler showing that picture there it connects your your piston to the moving shaft um so if it's still attached you'll have to overcome the the friction in the, in the whole in the whole stroke piston to actually move it at all which requires a lot more a lot more force so um it's just easier to decouple them so you can use much less force and move the the uh, moving shaft around left and right um, so to do that, you want to open up your low unit coupling door. 
you load in a coupler door, um, as most of you know, that will that will disengage or that will engage your emergency stop system. Um, so just be prepared for that. That's nothing normal, or that's, that's nothing abnormal. Um, and go in there, locate your coupler, showing that picture right there, and just remove that. Then reclose your door, um, and then reset the um, panic safety using the reset button on the console. And once you've done that, you should have something that looks like the picture shown down there in the bottom. Um, if the stroke is, if the piston is significantly in compression, you'll, it's worthwhile to turn the mechanic system on for a moment and just move it back in tension so that you have, you have travel with your air am, your moving shaft. Um, once you have that, just go ahead and press the air am button and turn, turn that on and confirm that you can move toggle the uh, tension compression button for the air am and just confirm that you can move in both directions. Again, if not that, you that may be an issue. We might have to look into that. It should be able to do both with without too much pressure, really. Um, you can use that little that little knob between the uh, hydraulic gauges just to confirm or to uh, add a little more pressure if needed. But it shouldn't it shouldn't take it shouldn't take much more than a half kilonewton to, to move um, the air if it's decoupled. If it takes more than that, a kilonewton or more than more than a kilonewton, really, then that's an indication that there's a lot of friction or something's going on there. It's not appropriate, not not proper. Uh, so then the, the final item we'll cover is just uh, a quick mention of additional maintenance items. Um, since the system has been down for a while and you're kind of coming back to it again, starting up again for the first time in a while at least, it'd be worthwhile to go over some of these things, at least briefly. Uh, so this is a portion of the uh, maintenance schedule that we outline in our operations manual, which again, you should have in one of your, the binders we provided for you uh, at the time of installation. It'll also be present in QuickSim if you're familiar with, with accessing the manuals from QuickSim, it'll be there as well. Uh, so this shows a number of items to check or change and the frequency, frequency increasing um, as you go further right. Uh, so we'll discuss a few of these quickly. We already discussed a number of them, um, but the ones that are pertinent we'll talk about briefly. Uh, if you're using a pocket jaw and you're using, well, any any pocket jaw instance really, um, well, if you're if you're in the the standard jaws, uh, you'll be using our copper grips or our, our stainless steel grips too, I suppose, um, to load your sample, to fix it in the jaws. You'll want to check those. It's now as good time as any to jet eventually, or essentially just check those and see that they're clean, not overly damaged. Um, if there's a lot of wear on them, like the one shown in that picture there to the right, if it's Warrants and we will not heat as well. Um, not saying you won't be able to heat at all, but the heating may, the heating control will, will be worse than it has to be. Um, so we, we provided copper cleaner um, with every system. So it'll be worthwhile if those seem dirty to just take a few moments to clean them. Um, if they're really worn, maybe look into replacing some. The same thing with the wear plates. Um, on the pocket jaws themselves, just the, the copper uh, copper pieces essentially that the, the grips slide into contact with when they're loading. Um, those same thing, they're, they're copper, they get dirty over time. So those are worth checking and cleaning if necessary. Um, we already discussed the vacuum oil levels and the, the tank cleaning potentially. Uh, anytime you you really finish running the system, um, as it says, daily is the idea to check your vacuum tank. If it's getting dirty, clean it whenever. Um, daily is ideal. I mean, the, your, your vacuum only runs as well as your maintenance, really. Uh, I've seen it before. I, I can't think of too many times when I've seen a vacuum that um, maybe an electrical component dies um, and so it doesn't work. But I've seen as many cases in the field where 
a vacuum isn't working, I'm told, and then it's just a matter of it, the vacuum tank is really dirty and it's not being cleaned and debris getting into the vacuum all over the interior of the vacuum itself. Um, the vacuum tank's really dirty and then it just makes it much harder to get your the vacuum levels you want. If you, you know, the vacuum operation is very dependent on regular maintenance, just, just keeping things clean in there. Uh, so that's very important. That can't be understated really, especially if you're doing hydro wedge testing, all the graphite and the, um, the nickel paste, all those things really, really make a mess. Um, uh, and since we're mentioning the vacuum tank, the, the back door that gets quite dirty. That's something that a lot of customers tend to overlook. Um, but it can get as bad as you'll see pitting around your O-ring seal, the back door, pretty pretty easily if, if there's if it's not being cleaned, you, you'll start seeing that and that may affect your vacuum level. So that's cleaning the vacuum tank is quite important if you, if you want to be able to get to good vacuum levels. Um, again, oil levels already talked about those. The emergency stop button that's if necessary, it's very important if, if in a case where you need it, hopefully you'll never need it, but if in a case where you do need it, it's important that it works. So our maintenance schedule recommends every every week just checking that. Um, we've already tested that to some extent um, in this manual or in this uh, brief little guide here. And then changing water filters and rough pump oils. Um, it was been sitting stagnant for a while. Uh, we didn't talk about the water filter. The water filter is shown right there in the picture on the right. Uh, we provide a, a number of those, I believe, with um, the unit and installation. I may be wrong about that. Um, but those recommend changing every three months. So it may be practical to, to change that now too. Just get whatever may be sitting in there out of your system. This has been stagnant for a little bit, for a little while. Um, that is covered in a good amount of detail in the operations manual. There's a maintenance section from where I, that's where I pulled this uh, little chart from. That covers it pretty good detail, pretty clearly. Um, and then the rest of the maintenance schedule, a yearly or even greater than yearly frequency um, is shown here, this last bit. Uh, you'll see it mentions again, changing oil filters, changing the diffusion pump oil, um, replacing the vacuum tank O-ring that we talked about before that maybe it's cracked, maybe it's just getting old. You, know, you can determine for yourself if that needs to be replaced or not. Um, changing the glycol, um, changing the, again, other oils and filters. Um, those are largely at a yearly level. We show here in the picture on the top, that's your um, load unit filter canister right there. So you're your oil filter for your load unit is stored in that. Um, the bottom right is a picture of one of the hydraulic pump load unit filters, filter canister with filter inside. Um, if they've been sitting for a while, if they're sitting outdoors, I know, I know some hydraulic pumps are located outdoors. Uh, it's been sitting for a while, not, not running outdoors. That may be more reason to consider replacing the filter just to make sure that if it's rusted inside or anything, maybe over the winter time or this early spring season we have here not running, if there's maybe rust or something else building up inside the pump in the reservoir not from it not running at all, not moving the oil well enough or circulating it at all, maybe it's worth changing those. Um, so use your judgment on those things essentially. And uh, that concludes our uh, PowerPoint here. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'll hand it back to Fulvio, I guess, or Dan Quigley, and uh, we can start the uh, question and answer session. Yeah, Eric, uh, thank you very much for your uh, very nice presentation, showing all the details and all the, uh, the care that should be taken uh, when we start in the Glebo after a long shutdown. So thanks a lot. Uh, we have seen uh, a few questions um, proposed in the, the in the chat window 
And uh, well, uh, Brian Smihoski is actually answering them. Uh, okay. So yeah, so I, yeah, I, I ran a little bit longer than I thought. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, no problem. So this is uh, an, another point is that well, some some of our colleagues asked for the presentation, and also uh, Brian, uh, uh, well, uh, he showed the link that we can download uh, your presentation. So I think this uh, will uh, well will answer uh, everybody that wants the presentation. If there is any any anything else that we can uh, we can add, please. Uh, Post your question on on the on the on the chat uh, window, so that we can we can work on that. Especially if, if it needs more time for uh, for uh, well, the answer is longer. Uh, so please do it. Uh, well, while we do uh, well, you, you place your question. Uh, please uh, well, check for the next uh, the next uh, webinar that we have planned next week, same day, same time. So we have uh, Dr. Wayne Chen, that well, is a, it's a long, uh, well, uh, well, it's a long partner of BSI for more than two decades. And he has a lot of experience with global users and also he helped to design several of our, our devices uh, in, well, in the, the former times uh, so, uh, Dr. Wayne Chen will make a, uh, well, a, a webinar and to, well, to show the best practices when using the Glebo and also showing a lot of examples for both R&D uh, in academia and also industry. And uh, so, uh, we, we have a, well, a full range of tests and simulations with many examples. So, this is the next uh, next presentation, next webinar that we uh, we have for next Thursday, the same time. Okay, so in the meantime, uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to invite uh, Don, our business development manager, to say something about the link uh, for the uh, well uh, for uh, for the survey for the the following uh, the, the next webinars. Uh, and the subjects and some suggestions, so we can always uh, add uh, your uh, opinion or, or inform what you want to hear from us. Okay, Don, can you please uh, say something sure. about yes, it? Thanks, Fulvio. Fulvio. Thanks. Yes, yes, thanks, Fulvio. Thanks, Eric, for a great presentation. Um, you know, moving forward, you know, as we're all changing, um, you know, our roles at, with the COVID situation, some of us may be working from home for longer extended uh, time than we'd like. Uh, we want to stay connected with our customers and uh, an agreeable community. So I will send out a survey that is going to ask for your opinion on the best topics that you would like to hear moving forward. Um, we're not sure if we're going to have these webinars on a weekly or biweekly basis. Uh, we may have them on a weekly basis for a couple weeks and then switch to bi-weekly, just depending on how the COVID situation uh, rolls out and uh, we determine the lockdown situations. Um, but I will post the webinar um, or the survey link in here in the webinar. And then I can also ask Suyesh um, from DTS to uh, send it out on the uh, WhatsApp uh, chats as well. Um, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Okay, so just uh, just before, uh, well, uh, uh, Mr. Suyash Nadkarni can can uh, end uh, this webinar. Maybe I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Wayne Chen to perhaps to say a few things about his next week's presentation very quickly. Bobby, you want me to talk to something about my next uh, webinar? Yeah, well, just just a general overview about next week's presentation. Okay. Um, well, um, I would like to, you know, you guys uh, uh, to look at the um, story first, uh, because you all know that the Gribo is really a research platform. I mean, it can do like thousands of kinds of testing, really. Um, so I, I would rather, you know, your most interest first, 
um, before I do my kind of presentation. I mean, I can talk for days. Uh, you know that. So if you guys could uh, um, make a quick um, um, answer, a quick survey that uh, we put out in, the, in the, um, what's up. Tell me what the most interesting topic that you would like to hear, and I will I will do that first. Uh, the, 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 of course, there are some tests which are the most popular, such as you know melting testing, NST, unit extra compression, uh, and sickle procedure. You know all this uh, we can talk, but again, um, some of the tests are pretty um, straightforward. Um, there are some lots of trick, tricks that, that we can learn from each other for sure. So again, uh, please let us know what are the most interesting topics you would like to listen first, and I will spend more time on those that you are most interested. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss during the presentation. You know, whatever you have. Okay. Yeah, Thank before, you very much. To stay, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wayne Chen. Uh, well, uh, we uh, we are we are all looking forward to to watch your presentation next week. Uh, well, uh, at this point, uh, on behalf of DSI, I'd like to thank you, everybody, uh, to participate in this webinar. It was a pleasure to get in touch with our Indian friends, and now I invite uh, Mr. Suyash Natkarni to close the meeting. Hello, Suyash, are you still there? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fulvio, Dr. Wayne Chen, and uh, the team DSI from the USA to have conducted this very interesting and very important uh, topic of restarting the Gable after a long shutdown. I think it has been a very uh, well attended uh, conference and as I would like to thank uh, the teams from Steel Authority of India Limited, Tata Steel, IIT Durki, JSW Steels, EHL Welding Research Institute, Institution of Plasma Research, IIT Madras, Defense Metallurgical Lab, National Metallurgical Lab, IIT Bombay, Liquid Propulsion Systems and QSG College Center of Excellence for Welding and all the members of the Global Forum who have attended uh, the seminar, I have a very big thank you. And uh, please uh, keep uh, abreast of the new, uh, you know, the next series of uh, webinars that we will be announcing. And uh, do participate in large numbers. And we look forward to meeting you next time and next week, the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Yes, thank you. Thank yeah, you thank you. See you guys next week. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for you. Bye-bye. Good day. See you next week. Bye-bye.